Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. We're expecting to have months, as we've said, uh, as opposed to days. The shutdown of the Sunshine Bridge. How can you not be for liberty? I mean, this is about liberty. This is about protecting our liberty. This is what the Bill of Rights and the Constitution are all about. The fight to fix the state's justice system. If we can catch those cancer diseases very early, then almost uh, the survival rate is very, very high. A potential breakthrough in breast cancer detection. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Moro. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, we've got some exciting news for Avery Island with its famous salt dome and Tabasco sauce heritage. It's been added to the National Register of Historic Places. It's yet another part of our state's rich culture and history that has been recognized as a national historic place. It's great news there. Now let's check out some other stories making headlines across Louisiana. Harvesting of the first legal crop of medical marijuana happened this week. NOLA.com reports GB Sciences, the licensed grower working with LSU's Ag Center, expects the drying process to begin next week. The company says it could have the product packaged and ready to ship by the middle of November, but it's unclear when medical marijuana would be commercially available in the state. ACT scores among Louisiana's high school students declined in the latest study of results and remains below the national average. The group that gives the tests shows the latest national average composite is 20.8 for the 2018 graduating class. Our state average is 19.2. That's down from 19.5 a year before. The test measures how students perform in English, reading, math, and science, and a perfect score is 36. A Louisiana researcher has a $1.6 million grant to try to develop a scanner that can rapidly check after prostate cancer surgery to see whether all traces of cancer have been removed. J. Quincy Brown of Tulane University will work with engineers, mathematicians, and physicians on developing a rapid microscopy scanner. A major milestone this week in the fallout of a widespread Catholic sex abuse crisis. The head of the Diocese of Baton Rouge says he will release the names of priests who have been credibly accused of sexual abuse within his territory. Bishop Michael Duca's announcement came on the same day leaders from the Archdiocese of New Orleans and three other state dioceses said they would also release names of priests accused of sexual abuse. Governor John Bell Edwards is announcing details of nearly $7 million in spending across the state on prisoner rehabilitation and education programs, crime victims services, and other criminal justice initiatives. The dollars come from savings associated with the state's shrinking prison population from sentencing law changes last year. Big announcement for drivers, especially in Northwest Louisiana. State leaders celebrated the official opening of the I-49-220 interchange in Shreveport. It puts into place another segment of the nearly 40-mile-long I-49 corridor. The total project cost from the Arkansas state line to I-220 is about $650 million. Now that was good news about roads. Now to the bad news. Lawsuits have been filed in the week since the Sunshine Bridge, which crosses the Mississippi River near Donaldsonville. A barge carrying a crane struck the bridge early Friday morning, October 12th. DOTD announced this week the bridge would remain closed until permanent repairs could be made. These pictures show the damage caused by the collision. Marquette Transportation operated the towboat that ran the crane barge into the southwest side of the bridge. 
Marquette is the same company operating the towboat that crashed barges into Mardi Gras World in New Orleans this year. The U.S. Coast Guard is investigating and says Marquette is cooperating. With the bridge closed, DOTD suggests detours, which include travel to the Gramercy Bridge, 20 miles south, or to the ferry at Plaquemine, 28 miles north. Reopening the White Castle Ferry 10 miles from Donaldsonville is not an option. The damaged bridge is a major connector serving plants, businesses, schools, and parish government. The latest data shows about 23,000 vehicles use the bridge every day. Uh, we're expecting to have months, as we've said, uh, as opposed to days. Uh, th what's the value of that or what's the impact of that? Well, right now we're in the process of modeling the proposed repair to the project. We've got a conceptual plan for the repair. Uh, we're modeling that to understand what effect this repair will have in terms of its load capacity and how it's going to manage it. And then once that occurs, we're going to have to determine if the materials that are needed for the repair are going to be available to us. If they're locally sourced here in Louisiana, that will make it a lot easier for us to move a lot quicker uh, after we have final plans done. And if they're not locally sourced, we're going to have to figure out where will the steel come from, how will we manage getting it here, and how quickly can we get it here. We're talking about some pretty significant beams, if you can imagine, uh, typically that are pre-ordered when you're building a bridge. And these types of structures or elements aren't just laying around at a local hardware store. So determination's been made that we're not going to do a temporary repair. It's going to be the permanent repair for it, which is why we have to make certain that it's going to withstand uh, continued uh, load-bearing capacities. And when you say months, would that be two, three, four, well, it, five, and seven? That has yet to be determined. You don't know um, if it could be half a year. That's or correct. And so be, the, the issue is, are the parts going to be available to us and how quickly will they be available? What will be the time to go through the design for implementing that improvement or that maintenance work that needs to be done on the structure? How will the weather impact us? Uh, if you think about this bridge structure, we're not just hanging a piece of steel on the bridge. We're actually going to have to approach it from beneath the structure. So you're going to need some specialized equipment to be able to get to that height in the water conditions. And so we've already worked with the Coast Guard to uh, make sure there's a no wake zone under the bridge because those waves will affect a barge that's holding equipment. Uh, we've also uh, made certain that there are no more vehicles or vessels, I should say, traveling in that particular bay where the span is damaged. So there's a lot of factors, and as we go, we intend to update the public. Uh, but once we know exactly what we're doing and what's the availability of materials, we can then talk a little bit more about how long. Ideally, I'd like to have it less than a month. We just don't know yet. I'd rather not give you a predetermined answer until we have all of the facts to be able to stand by those decisions. So it sounds like this is almost as if you are completing a bridge that's brand new and hadn't it, been used before. It, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good approach to it. Um, we're, we're having to design, um, understand the impact, as well as acquire materials that we don't know yet exactly what that is going to be. Uh, we've worked with a couple of other uh, states that had similar impacts. It's not common to have a span impacted like what we've seen in this situation. We've identified um, where the pavement has shifted a little bit. There may be continued movement. So we're even going to have to put uh, monitors on the bridge to understand what's happening during the repair to make sure there's not progressive degrading of the structure. So it's a pretty, under, pretty significant undertaking to get the structure are open. Our commitment is to not open the bridge temporarily. We had hoped to be able to put traffic on one side of the bridge in one lane to at least provide some access. Unfortunately, it's been ruled out that that's not possible because of the damage. Uh, and so since we're going to have to keep the bridge closed for the repair, we might as well make the permanent repair first as opposed to doing a temporary repair and then a permanent repair and having multiple closures. And this further drives home the point of the need for more crossings over the Mississippi River. Yeah, it's for a new bridge, you're talking significant years uh, and significant investigation. One of the uh, benefits of this process is because it's an existing structure, there's an emergency condition in, in a sense, and so you don't have the same types of permits and things that you have to go through, but there's still going to be precautions we have to take when we do that repair because the river is going to have to be shut down potentially for some of that repair, uh, at least under that particular bay. And what's the impact on a a very busy segment of the river. People forget that we're the Department of Transportation and Development and that includes maritime traffic, ports, and all of the stuff that comes on rail. All of that's impacted, whether it's sugarcane trucks or industrial tank trucks, all of that's going to be impacted by this project. 
Now, Sean Wilson tells me that the towing company is cooperating, but his department is filing the claims that it can file. The National Safety Board is also involved. And because maritime law is involved here, some of those people filing claims will have a tough time recouping some of their losses. Last time you watched a TV crime drama, you may have noticed that to send someone to jail, all 12 people on the jury had to agree to convict. It's something that's ingrained in us in pop culture, that it takes a unanimous decision. But LPB's Kelly Spires is here to tell us that that's not how it works in our state. Kelly, Louisiana residents can go to jail with only 10 people on the jury saying that you're guilty. That is right. We're one of two states where 10 out of 12 isn't a hung jury. But Louisiana voters will have the opportunity to bring state regulations in line with the rest of the country by approving a constitutional amendment on the November ballot. In Louisiana, it's easier to lose your rights than in any other state. A person can actually be sentenced to life imprisonment in the state of Louisiana with a 10 to 2 jury verdict. And there is no other state in the United States where less than a unanimous jury verdict can condemn a person to life imprisonment. Douglas DeLosa knows this too well. 1986, my house was broken into in the middle of the night. I was beaten unconscious, tied. Uh, later found out that my wife had been murdered that uh, night. And he was charged with the crime. Approximately nine months later, I went to trial. I, after nine days, I was found guilty by a vote of 11 to 1 and given the mandatory sentence of life imprisonment without the benefit of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence, which to me is a death penalty. DeLosa did not commit that minutes. crime, and eventually he proved it. So, I've been home since January 8th, 2001, almost 18 years now. My first seven years or so that I was home, I struggled just to get by. Now he works with a nonprofit called Rising Foundations that helps formerly incarcerated people get back on their feet. DeLosa focuses on exonerees, people who were found to be not guilty of the crimes they were convicted of. I don't ever want to see a person have to go through what I went through those first seven years, not knowing where to turn or who to turn to for help when they were wrongfully convicted through malicious prosecution. Ed Tarpley practices law in Alexandria, but in the 90s, he was Grant Parrish's district attorney. As the chief prosecutor there, he put men behind bars on votes like DeLosa's. But once he learned about the origins of the rules that led to those convictions, he made it a life goal to change them. It goes all the way back to the Jim Crow era. In 1880 is when it was passed. Uh, this was three years after the end of Reconstruction, which ended in 1877. That law was cemented in the state constitution of 1898. What took place was an effort to uh, deprive African Americans of their newly uh, won rights of citizenship. And, and, and this law was clearly intended to make it easier to convict African American citizens. There's no question about that. But DAs around the state have grown accustomed to those rules. Less severe felonies require all members of a six-person jury to agree for a conviction, so prosecutors will upcharge so that they only need a 10 to 2 vote. The system we have in Louisiana is clearly illogical and unfair because we have this strange system in which a person can be sentenced to life in prison with a vote of 10 out of 12 jurors. And two jurors are saying, no, we don't agree that the state, you know, proved this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We still have doubt. And these kinds of convictions happen often, though we don't know exactly how often. We don't have accurate data on that, unfortunately, because uh, the courts do not keep that data in Louisiana. Uh, fortunately, though, the advocate uh, did a lengthy and in-depth study this past year. The advocate analyzed 3,000 cases from the state's biggest jurisdictions from a six-year span. Almost 1,000 of them were convictions from a 12-person jury. Almost 400 of those were with a 10 to 2 or 11 to 1 vote. One argument for keeping the system the way it is now is that it makes it 
easier to put true criminals behind bars. Well, that is true. There's no question about that. But what I say is this, is that, that, um, that Arkansas and Mississippi and Texas are, are not having an argument about efficiency. I think that the prosecutors in Louisiana are fine people. They're outstanding lawyers. They are just as good as the lawyers in Texas and Mississippi, and I'm sure that they will be able to convict people that are truly guilty uh, under the unanimous jury system. But there aren't many folks making that argument. Tarpley says many staunch conservative organizations are for this change, like the Louisiana Family Forum and Americans for Prosperity. How can you not be for liberty? I mean, this is about liberty. This is about protecting our liberty. This is what the Bill of Rights and the Constitution are all about. Tarpley says the framers of the Constitution intended the jury trial system to protect citizens from the government. They believe that that, that for the government to take away one's liberty, that all of the jurors must agree. That was, what the, the, that was the central part of the jury trial protection. And Madison and Jefferson and Adams, all of these great men that wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights firmly believe that. Now, the framers, statistics, prosecutorial strategy, that can all be pretty abstract for a voter going to the polls on November 6th. Why should you care? because DeLosa did not commit the crime he was convicted of and ultimately exonerated for. If it's not impacting them directly today, it could certainly have a direct impact on themselves or a loved one in the future. I don't think anybody wants to have themselves or a loved one go to prison for whether it's one year, five years, much less the rest of their life, because the DA has less burden of proof than anywhere else in the country. Early voting starts next week. You can find your sample ballot online at govote.com. And to help deciphering the other constitutional amendments, you can find a guide to all six at parlouisiana.org. Kelly, thanks. We know that the cost of health care continues to go up and research continues to look for ways to bring expenses down and also give people quicker responses to illnesses and in general help make life better. I met with one such researcher who is doing work that could be available in your regular doctor's office within one to two years. Inside Patrick Taylor Hall on the campus of LSU, there is breakthrough science at work in the lab of mechanical engineering professor Manas Gartia. Gartia's research involves breast cancer genetic testing and the use of a smartphone to detect a breast cancer gene. The extraction and analysis of a person's DNA is at the heart of how this research would ultimately catch cancer before it's found on a mammogram. His goal is to make life-saving health care more affordable and readily available, especially to people like so many in Louisiana who live in rural areas. And we saw that even if people do not have access to doctors, everybody has a smartphone. So that's why we thought about if we can integrate this smartphone some way to some sensor so that it will be able to detect some gene or detect some diseases, then uh, that will be very, uh, very helpful. Gartia is combining emerging technologies for point of care or bedside testing with the rapid development of smartphone technology to detect this breast cancer gene. POC devices already exist for diabetes and pregnancy. Gartia thought, why not for breast cancer genetic testing? Here uh, uh, we use this uh, particular cancer gene as a uh, as a first uh, example, but this, this is a platform technology, so this can be extended to many other uh, diseases and many other uh, environmental problems as well. The importance of early detection is essential for survival and for healthy recovery. If we can catch those cancer diseases very early, then almost uh, the survival rate is very, very high. Almost it can be cancer-free, and sometimes you don't even need uh, uh, the chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Sometimes you just need some immunotherapy or, or some new uh, drugs 
will basically clear clear out your cancer. The key to fight cancer will be to detect very very early and uh, by doing low cost diagnosis um, if we can achieve that that will be truly profound. Be truly profound and mean the difference between needing harsh chemo or radiation therapies and even life and death. Eventually, Guardia says there will be, there'll be a smartphone app to download so you can see your test results. Louisiana football great Jimmy Taylor passed away this past Saturday, October 13th. This LPB, Louisiana legend, starred for LSU from 1955 to 57, and he went on to help build the Green Bay Packers dynasty under coach Vince Lombardi. He was inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame in 1976, and before that, the LSU and Louisiana Sports Hall of Fames. Jimmy Taylor was an all-around athlete at Baton Rouge High School, and when it came time to choose a college sport, he told LPB he had offers in basketball at powerhouse schools such as Duke and North Carolina. In fact, he told us in this 2010 interview that he was barely even on the football team as a high school junior, but that changed in a big way. My senior year, uh, Claude Harrison came in and took over as the head football coach at Baton Rouge High and I became a, a single wing uh, player and Warren Rabb was in the backfield with me and I became a passer and I kicked extra points and did different things. So I had a little bit of versatility. His next stop was LSU and more football. Well, I think probably to, uh, to stay home. I'd visited over to uh, Miami and out to Colorado. I'd visited out there with Will Walls, which had brought me out. And I visited a couple of the colleges and things and I opted to, uh, to stay at home and, and, and be here and help take care of my mother and, and play at home and establish myself here with the LSU Tigers. He also played in the very first Super Bowl in January 1967, though that game paled in comparison to the Super Bowls that followed and certainly those of today. We were representing the National Football League against the American Fo Football League, which had been in existence about uh, five, four or five years. And so we were representing all of the NFL. So we uh, you know, got our game plan and we were ready to play. We'd, beating Dallas to have the right to represent the National Football League. And so we were, they had hyped the game and we were playing out in Los Angeles. And I think the tickets were $15 and it wasn't a sellout. Taylor wound up playing his final pro season with the then brand new New Orleans Saints. Afterwards, he settled in Baton Rouge, though throughout his pro career, he called Baton Rouge home. Taylor was an avid weightlifter and always stayed in good physical shape. He said he believed God had given him extraordinary athletic ability and he always wanted to make a difference, contributing to worthwhile organizations in his local community and also in his state. Jimmy Taylor was a friend. He was 83 years old. Within the depths of the state's old growth cypress swamps is the Chittimacha Nation. It's a nation where stands of massive cane grew. This cane would become the source for the intricate baskets woven by their people. Produced and directed by LPB's Tika Loden and photographed by Rex Q. Fortenberry, the story of this renowned art and its survival is told by tribal member Roger Stoof. Once there was a holy woman. When she encountered a young Chittimacha woman, the holy woman dropped a basket on the path in front of her. The young woman took the basket home and studied it carefully. Then she learned from the holy woman how to weave the river king, how to gather and process the dyes, and how to pattern the designs. To this day, when a weaver goes into a cane patch and examines the cane, the joints still bear the impression of the holy woman's finger. The baskets themselves are made out of river cane, which you find in this area. We just cut this cane from a patch that we planted here on reservation probably five or six years ago and it's doing well and we take this cane and we'll split it and peel it to make the baskets with. Chittimacha basketry is intimately related back to the environment. It reflects the natural world of the Chittimacha that they experienced every day. The designs are zoomorphic and they have names that 
that are very expressive, like mouse tracks and things that the Chittimacha would have seen every day in their world. The designs were named these things in the Chittimacha language, and even though the language died out for a while and is being brought back now, those names were retained through the generations, and, and that shows the importance of Chittimacha basketry as a physical and, and visible expression of Chittimacha culture. Baskets have always been around. The patterns have been handed down from one generation to the next, and it just goes back as far back as you can trace. And all of the patterns that you see in the baskets are patterns from things around you. You may not realize it, but something like this is pattern in this would be Gusbi Su'u, which is the muscadine rind or peel, which, so story goes, the muscadine berry, when it's smashed, goes in four directions, the skin, and that's where that pattern came from. So every pattern is from things that you see, a uh, washtik kani, which is the eye of cattle pattern that you see in here, which is in a tray. Uh, you've got something like this, it's got the Jekt kani, which is the bird's eye. Jekt is red winged blackbird, kani is eye, but we call it bird's eye for short. Just all things from around you every day. So that's the patterns that we've got, and they've been around forever. And actually, the baskets touch uh, everything, the language, all that connects us with our ancestors because uh, you feel that, you know, when you're doing any of that. So. Now tomorrow, October 20th, you're invited to experience a celebration of native cultures at the fifth annual Chittimacha Pow Wow. It's at Cypress Bayou Casino in Sheraton. That's in St. Mary Parish. LPB will be on hand to preview the upcoming PBS series, Native America. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download's free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.